of Tristan Bailey, the cheerleader who was brutally murdered by her friend and classmate? Well, this is the killer, Aiden Fucci. It's not clear whether he is pretending to be crazy in this footage to weasel himself out of jail or if it's real. But what he did to Tristan that night can only be described as pure evil. But why did he do it? And will Tristan finally get the justice she deserves? Here is an update on the case. It Ain't My Problem Teen tells parents after being cheerleader 114 times. Just to recap, Tristan Bailey was a 13-year-old student and cheerleader at Patriot Oaks Academy in St. John's, Florida. She was one of five children of Stacy and Forrest Bailey and was described as a sweet girl who brought life to everyone around her. But on Mother's Day morning of May 9th, 2021, her family woke up to find her missing from her bed. The last time they saw her was around midnight, and now she was gone. By 10 a.m. that morning, a search was already underway, and everyone in the community had had gathered to help find the missing teen. The authorities had even issued a missing child alert. But unfortunately, at around 6 p.m., a jogger in the neighborhood would find a young girl's body hidden in the woods. The body would turn out to be Tristan. She had been stabbed 114 times in the head and neck and had multiple defensive wounds on her arms. A buck knife with a missing tip was found in a pond near her body, and the fragment would later be found lodged in Tristan's scalp. So how did she end up there? And who was behind this brutal killing? When investigators checked surveillance footage from around the neighborhood, they saw something pretty disturbing. At around 1.14 a.m., Tristan could be seen walking outside in the dimly lit streets. But she isn't alone. She's accompanied by a male figure, and they appear to be heading east toward a wooded area in their neighborhood, where her body would later be found. Less than two hours later, around 3.30 a.m., the male figure is seen running barefoot in the opposite direction. He was alone. This footage led investigators to the doorstep of 14-year-old Aiden Fucci, who happened to be Tristan's classmate and friend. Now that you're all caught up, let's continue. According to Aiden's arrest record, he admitted that he was indeed with Tristan that night at a mutual friend's house and that they left together at around 1.50 a.m. He claimed that while they were walking home, Tristan tried to grab him and he pushed her away real hard so that she hit her head on the ground and then he walked away in anger. However, investigators said that Aiden kept changing his story multiple times. At one time, he even claimed that Tristan had gone to meet up with a narcotics dealer in the woods. But when investigators found the dealer, they quickly determined that he had nothing to do with the case. This happened when Tristan was still missing. When her body was found, Aiden was still at the police station being questioned. When his mother came in to give him the news, his response was pretty cold and unfeeling. You found this boy? Where? In our neighborhood, down on Main Street. Is she good? No, no she's not. She's dead. That's why this is very important. It's all in you right now. Yeah, my problem. But what made this case really blow up was what Aiden did when the police came to take him after Tristan's body was found. Believe it or not, he actually took a selfie in the back seat of the police cruiser and posted it on Snapchat with the caption, Hey guys, has anybody seen Tristan lately? How insensitive is that? Someone in the comments reportedly replied, You were with her, Aiden you know what happened to her. Reports say that he was just a person of interest at the time and had not been charged yet. Still, this is really messed up. And it's not the only thing he did. He also posted several disturbing videos still in the backseat of the patrol car, acting like this was all a big joke to him. In this clip, he was with a friend and they appeared to be joking around and talking about Tristan. We're, we're having fun in a fucking cop car. Yep, Tristan. What's up guys? Tristan, if you fucking walk out the damn. In another clip, he's alone in the car saying, It's in a cop car, guys. She's tripping, dude. The public was completely outraged with these posts, which soon went viral. 
Many saw this as Aiden bragging about what he did to Tristan, while others saw it as an attempt to make himself look innocent. Whatever the case, his parents were also not amused by them, and even scolded him at the police station. It's all over, you're all over the internet, hang on. When the police searched Aiden's home, they found a buck knife sheath in his room, as well as wet shoes and a shirt with blood on them. They also found a notebook in his room with violent drawings of women, including one that showed a female with red X's on her breasts and severed arms with blood pouring out. Surveillance footage inside the home also showed Aiden walking into the house at 3.30 a.m. on the night of the murder, and not surprisingly, he was barefoot and holding a pair of Nike shoes. Another shocking footage showed Aiden's mom, Crystal Smith, washing blood out of her son's jeans at the time he was being questioned by the police. Then later, while at the police station, Crystal was reportedly overheard asking her son if he was sure there was nothing in his clothes from the night before. I don't think so, why? Aiden asked. Crystal was then observed giving Aiden a questioning look and whispered, blood. During the search warrant, police found the jeans in Aiden's room and it tested positive for blood. Additional blood evidence was discovered in the drain of the bathroom. Crystal was arrested in June 2021 and charged with evidence tampering. She pleaded guilty to the charges and was sentenced to 30 days in jail, plus five years probation. Crystal Smith is preparing to spend her first night in jail as she begins her 30-day sentence for tampering with evidence in the murder of 13-year-old Tristan Bailey. Bailey's mom took the stand today with a message for Smith. I may never know the answers, but this is one way, this is my one chance for Sophie. The ir irreparable damage that you have caused by your actions will forever be etched into our lives. As for Aiden, he was initially charged with second degree murder and held in a juvenile justice center. Second degree murder is when the killing was not premeditated. But in this case, chilling new information would be revealed, showing that Aiden had planned to kill that night. Apparently, a few days before Tristan's murder, Aiden had told some friends that he planned to kill someone by dragging them into the woods and sleeping them though he didn't specify who. In an interview with investigators, Aiden's girlfriend said that he often carried a knife with him and would sometimes sneak up on her and pretend to slit her throat, though she and other friends never took it seriously. The girlfriend went on to say that at one point, Aiden had asked her what she would do if he ever murdered someone. I don't know what my answer really was, but he would say that if he was going to murder someone, it was gonna be planned. Okay. I said that he would just walk at night or something and find like a random person walking to and just drag them in the woods. She also said that Aiden claimed to hear voices in his head when he was angry that would tell him to kill people. Aiden did admit to investigators that he was on antidepressants. With this new revelation, the prosecutors upgraded the charge to first degree murder. He pleaded not guilty to the charges and was held without bail to await trial. Now, while you might think that being in jail would at least give Aiden an opportunity to reflect on his actions and realize that what he did was wrong, that's not what happened. The sheriff's office incident reports document several instances where Aiden was involved in disruptive behavior, such as getting into fights, having contraband, bullying inmates, and threatening guards. One inmate would say that Aiden had told them that he was the real deal because he stabbed a girl face to face, unlike others who resorted to shooting someone. And like that's not enough, it was also revealed that Aiden had been sending text messages to his parents while in jail, in which he would refer to his cell as his bat cave and talk about playing video games on his tablet. In one message he sent to his dad on August 21st, he said, hey, I'm going to go back to my bat cave and call y'all. So love you. Bye. The tablet is about to die. It's at seven. In early September 2021, he wrote his mother saying, I was playing Candy Crush, but I guessed I ran out of lives. He also told her that he couldn't play online games, just offline. Basically, it seemed like he was having the time of his life in jail. Then, during his preliminary hearing, he began acting weird. Aiden Fucci looks around aimlessly, <coughs> appearing to be confused during court on Wednesday. What's going on? I've seen him before. 
He rocks back and forth and mumbles about demons. What's going on? I don't want to hear you demons. I don't want to hear you demons take my soul. You demons want to take my soul away. I don't want to hear you demons steal my soul. I spoke with attorney Jean Nichols, who is not affiliated with this case. Is it common for high profile cases like this for the defendant to have a mental incompetency evaluation? What, what you would see in most of these cases similar to this is yes, you're going to have your client evaluated for competency, especially for a young person like this to have allegedly committed such an awful crime. Many who saw the footage believed that Aiden was putting up an act to get out of going to prison. But a forensic psychologist who reviewed the footage said that it was hard to tell if the odd behavior was real or not. From my perspective, he, it seemed genuine given that pattern of behavior today. It seemed that Aiden would plead the not guilty card by reason of insanity. But for some reason, his lawyer never asked for a mental competency evaluation to be done. Then in January, 2023, just before jury selection was to begin, Aiden surprised everyone when he changed his plea to guilty. He also wrote a letter apologizing to Tristan's family saying, first off, I want to say that I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all the pain I caused to the Bailey family. I'm sorry to the friends, brothers, sisters, mom, dad, and any other family relatives. I know my apology will not fix anything or bring her back, but I hope it will help in some way. Before he was sentenced, Tristan's family was given a chance to give their victim impact statement. One of Tristan's sisters brought an empty jar on the witness stand and dropped heart-shaped stones into the jar. One by one, making sure that each one had an impact as it landed. This jar now holds 114 stones, one for each of the 114 stab wounds that my sister had to endure. It was one hour and 42 minutes between when my sister was last seen and when Aiden Fucci was next seen, running out of the woods holding his shoes because his feet hurt. It's funny that such a simple statement can bring such anger. She went on to ask Aiden several pointed questions, including if he got caught up in the thrill of the kill. Did she see you coming at her with the knife? Or did you see her while she wasn't paying attention? Did she scream out for help? Or was she para paralyzed with agony? Did she cry for my mother? Did she beg you to stop? The grieving family asked the judge to give Aiden the maximum sentence, saying that he could not be rehabilitated and was beyond saving. Tristan's devastated mom says that the thought that she wasn't there to protect her daughter that day still eats at her every day. It's 3 a.m. I'm startled awake again, as I am every night, multiple times a night. My head is pounding in pain. My thoughts are racing. My anxiety is high. My chest is tight. The thoughts immediately start. The time tells me that it's over. Tristan lost her life by now. At the end of each testimony, Tristan's loved ones dropped a white, heart-shaped stone on top of the jar, filled with aqua stones. As they added their white stones, they shared what it represented to them, something Aiden had taken away from them when he killed Tristan. But get this, despite everything he had done, his family actually tried to get the judge to go easy on him. His grandmother even wrote a letter begging the judge not to take him away, saying that there is still some good in him. I know he has to be punished and, um, for his actions, and I love him, and his family love him very much, too. And I, I know we're a very large Christian family, and uh, we pray all the time, and I just hope you consider a little bit, and please don't take him out of our lives forever. She apologized to Tristan's family saying, I and my family feel deep sadness for the loss of your beautiful child. And I know the heartache that you and your family must feel. You have been and will continually be in my prayers. After all the testimonies were made, it was now the judge's turn to give his sentence. He called the case the most difficult and shocking case that St. John had encountered. What is also very troubling is that this crime had no motive. This was not done out of greed. 
It was not done in retaliation, retribution, or revenge. It was not a crime of passion. It was not a crime that was committed because he felt rejected by her. It was not done in in a fit of uncontrollable anger. There was no reason. There was no purpose. It was done for no other reason than to satisfy this defendant's internal desire to feel what it was like to kill someone. The judge sentenced Aiden to life in prison, but said that because of his age, he'll be eligible for parole after 25 years. After the sentencing, Tristan's dad had a few words for his little girl. Tristan, to let you know, we are so extremely proud of the person that you were in your time here. We have seen that when you went out into the world, you gave it your very best. You should be proud of the friend that you were, the teammate you were, and what you left behind and the people that knew you, that we trust, will go forward and continue to make the world a better place. This is Sutton High School calling. We are in lockdown. We need assistance right now. Okay, we're picking up. There's a student with a gun. I'm saying pull the trigger. The killer's done. Now the is done, right? Love you. This is TJ Lane, a cold-blooded killer who at only 17 years old killed three of his classmates and left one paralyzed. But instead of showing some remorse for his actions, he is seen in this footage flipping off his victims' families. But why did he do it? And what would make someone this young become so cold and evil? Let's take a look at this chilling case in which court cameras catch teen killer flipping off victims' family. TJ Lane had a pretty troubled upbringing. His dad, Thomas Lane Jr., was in and out of prison for domestic violence charges and had even been charged with attempted murder in 2002. His mother, Sarah Nolan, was not any better as she was rarely at home and had also been arrested at various occasions for domestic abuse. The neighbors who knew the family said that they never saw TJ and his two siblings playing or behaving like normal children. At some point, the parents lost custody of the kids, and TJ and his siblings were sent to live with their grandparents. TJ attended Chartham High School, where some of the students described him as reserved and kind of an outcast. He mostly kept to himself, though he did have a few friends. However, others said that he was kind and friendly and seemed like any normal teenage boy, though some of his friends said they never noticed that. In the beginning, TJ was said to be a very good student, He was a good student in school, and he he just like turned goth and like his grades started dropping. Around that time, he also started getting into trouble with the law and had actually been arrested twice in 2009. In the first incident, he was charged with assault after he and his cousin allegedly punched and choked their uncle during a fight. In the second case, he was accused of punching another boy in the face and was given community service. On December 30th, 2011, TJ reportedly posted a disturbing poem on his Facebook that said that he longed for only one thing, for the world to bow at his feet, and that he was better than the rest, all the ones that he detests, going on to say, I am death. Any of you always been the sod. Now, feel death not just mocking you, not just stalking you, but inside of you. Wriggle and writhe, feel smaller beneath my might. Seizure in the pestilence, but at some point his grades started dropping and he was transferred to a nearby alternative school called Lake Academy. And while it may have raised a few eyebrows, no one could really have predicted the horror that was about to happen. The morning of February 27th, 2012, started like any other day for the students at Chardon High School. Many of the students would normally hang out in the cafeteria before classes. Some were getting breakfast while others were waiting for the bus to take them to their morning classes in the nearby Lake Academy or Auburn Career Center, a vocational school offering computers and other classes. Things were going well until around 7.30 a.m. when the nightmare began. Without any warning, a boy stood up in the cafeteria armed with a .20 22 caliber handgun and opened fire. We get on the PA system. Yeah. 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 I started in high school. We got fired guns, shot yeah. multiple, yeah. multiple guns. Yeah. 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 You know where? Um, I went over by the gym. Yeah. This is Sutton High School calling. We are in lockdown. We need assistance right now. Okay, we're picking up. There's a student with a gun. 
911, what's your emergency? Hey, this is uh, Principal Chardon again. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, um, the alleged ran out the back door down the, uh, the easement towards the tennis courts past the pool. Okay, do you have any description of clothing? We have white t-shirt, shaggy dark hair, tall skinny. The rampage lasted for about 47 seconds, and within that time, six students had been shot. Witnesses said that the shooter, who was identified as TJ Lane, seemed to be targeting a group of boys who were seated at one table. He shot five of them before leaving the cafeteria and shot a girl that he came across. The school football coach named Frank Hall managed to stop any further damage by chasing the shooter out of the building, where the police came and arrested him. When it was over, at least one student was dead, four others wounded. Nate Mueller was in the cafeteria eating breakfast with friends when the carnage started. He saw the alleged shooter, who he identified as 17-year-old junior T.J. Lane, sitting by himself at a table behind them. We heard a loud pop, like a firecracker almost. Yeah. And I turned around and I looked and he was standing above his table, you know, pointing his gun and he took one more shot. He saw one friend fall on the table and another lying on the floor in a pool of blood. A third was trying to crawl away as another shot rang out and grazed Nate's ear. It was terror. It was, everything had just gone tunnel vision. You see glances of your friends laying all over the place. There's blood. There's people screaming. Everybody's running in different directions, and you're just trying to get out. But before the rampage could go any further, a school football coach chased the suspect out of the school where he escaped on foot. He was arrested just a short distance away. That coach and many other teachers being hailed as heroes tonight. The six victims were rushed to the hospital, but unfortunately, three died of their injuries within two days. 16-year-old Daniel Parmeter was pronounced dead that same day. He was a high school junior and was at the cafeteria that day waiting for a bus at the Auburn Career Center, where he studied computer science. We were supposed to go and pick out colleges. We were supposed to go visit Ohio State next month to come here and pick out a casket. I don't even know what that is. I don't know. I don't like it. I'm mad. Russell King Jr. died the next day at 12.42 a.m. He was just 17 years old and also a junior. He was a student at both Chardon High School and Auburn Career Center and was studying alternative energy technologies. His friends said that he was sweet and friendly to everyone he met. Every day in the hallway, he'd look at me and it'd be, hi, Brittany, how's your day going? So that's what I miss about him. Demetrius Hewlin was a 16-year-old and the third student to be reported dead on February 28th. His mom said in an interview that her son wasn't a morning person and was often late for school. But sadly, on that day, he wasn't late enough. When asked what she would like to say to her son's killer, the mom shocked everyone by saying, I would tell him I forgive him because a lot of times they don't know what they're doing. That's all I'd say. I taught Demetrius not to live in the past, to live in today, and forgiveness is divine. Other victims of the tragic shooting include 17-year-old Nick Walzak. He was shot multiple times in the arm, neck, cheek, and back. While he survived the attack, he was left permanently paralyzed from the waist down. 18-year-old Joy Rickers, who was a senior at the school, suffered a minor injury and was released from the hospital after a few days. Nate Mueller was injured by a bullet that grazed his right ear and didn't need to be hospitalized. The shooting left the entire community reeling with shock and grief as they struggled to come to terms with everything that had happened. I'm just really shocked that it was CJ. He was just honestly really quiet, but you could always tell he had a very sad look in his eyes all the time. He usually just kept to himself. Uh, I, I just want to say that I'm sorry to the families, um, to the victims. Um, I wish I could have done more. Several vigils were held in honor of the victims and were attended by thousands of people who showed up wearing red, which is one of Chardon High School's school colors to show their support. If the entire community of Chardon didn't come out to say goodbye to the victims of Monday's shooting, it sure looked like it. This is Chardon, this is what we do. We follow through everything we do. You just still feel like you're all, you know, part of it. You're all in this together. Thousands packed inside St. Mary's Church, and when room quickly ran out inside, thousands more gathered on the front lawn to watch the prayer service on a screen. May I ask that we have a moment of silence? The speakers included the district superintendent, Joseph Burgent, as well as Andy Fenchik, the principal of Chardon High School, who had this message for students. 
I'm very proud of you. I'm proud of the way you conducted yourselves and the way you've acted since this horrible event. Governor Kasich also spoke to the grief-stricken audience. All Ohioans, all Ohioans, from the west to the east, from the north to the south, we all pray for you. Following his arrest, TJ was recorded in a squad car saying, I sh people. When asked by an officer why he did it, he replied, I don't know. He was charged with three counts of aggravated murder, two counts of aggravated attempted murder, and one count of felonious assault. It was revealed at the hearing that TJ had admitted to 10 rounds of ammunition during the incident. He also told the police that he didn't know the victims and that they were selected randomly. However, a witness who said that he knew the shooter said that TJ and several of the victims used to be friends in middle school, but drifted apart in high school. One of the victims had allegedly been dating TJ's former girlfriend, and he was not happy about that. It was reported that a few days before the shooting, TJ had actually posted on Twitter, warning his classmates that he would bring a gun to school. But at the time, no one took him seriously. Police said that the gun used in the massacre was bought legally by TJ's uncle, and the teen stole it from him. Despite his young age, TJ was tried as an adult and indicted on all six charges. He initially pleaded not guilty to the charges by reason of insanity, but later changed his plea to guilty. Relying on a wheelchair, 18-year-old Nick Walzak continues rehabilitation from his own gun wounds a year ago. When T.J. Lane entered the courtroom, Lane never glanced in Walzak's direction, appearing expressionless as Judge David Fury accepted Lane's guilty plea. I understand that you're pleading guilty. You are pleading guilty to the three aggravated murder charges with the firearm specifications. Yes, Your Honor. Lane's parents were in the courtroom, as well as his aunt and his grandparents. All declined to comment and Lane was repeatedly asked by the judge if he understood the guilty plea he was entering. Now, do you understand that if a sentence of life without parole is imposed, you will remain in prison until your own death? Yes. Also in the courtroom, the parents of 16-year-old Daniel Parmatore and 16-year-old Demetrius Yulin, both to death by Lane. Defense attorney Ian Friedman said, it was Lane's decision alone to plead guilty. Now, after pleading guilty, you'd expect that TJ would at the very least be showing some remorse for what he did, but you'd be wrong. During his sentencing hearing held in March, 2013, TJ actually showed up in court wearing a white t-shirt with the word killer written on it. Investigators said it was the same t-shirt he had worn during spree. But like that's not already bad enough, he kept smirking and smiling while the victim's grieving families poured their hearts out about their loss. I will miss Demetrius and I have enough memories to last me a lifetime. That child stole my baby's life and he should never be able to do this to anyone ever again. Daniel Parameter's mother called him a monster and a weak, pathetic, vile coward who doesn't deserve to be called a human being. I hope you have a cold, rough, unkind, harsh prison life with monsters like yourself. I want you to endure years and years of pain, and it, which is, in my opinion, not harsh enough. If I had my choice, you would die an extremely slow death. Nick Walzak's mom told him that he was lucky that there were so many police officers in the room because she would have wiped that smirk off his face. I hate you for the pain you have caused, Nick. You chased him down the hall and fired the last bullet that paralyzed him. You're lucky I have to read this because I'd be staring at you the whole time. When he was given a chance to speak, this disgusting monster actually flipped them off and told them the most despicable thing that I don't even want to repeat. The prosecution said that this action was proof that TJ is a disgusting human being and that the rampage was cold, calculated, and a premeditated killing. The judge said that TJ's actions in court showed that he simply did everything for attention and wanted to make the front page news. In the end, TJ was given three life sentences for each life that he took that day. He was taken to Allen Correctional Institution in Lima, Ohio to serve his sentence. But just when everyone thought they'd heard the last of him, this happened. Breaking news, TJ Lane, the Chardon High School shooter, 
on the loose right now. He escaped this evening from a prison in Western Ohio. Here's what we know right now. T.J. Lane and another prisoner, 45-year-old Clifford Operud, escaped from the prison tonight around 7.40. Apparently, after being convicted, T.J. never learned his lesson. He actually proved to be as much trouble in prison as he was outside. Reports from the institution revealed that he'd been disciplined at least seven times for behavioral issues, such as peeing on walls, self and refusing to perform assigned prison tasks. Then on September 11th, 2014, at around 7.38 p.m., TJ and two other inmates used a makeshift ladder to scale a fence and escape from prison during recreational hours. This footage shows them running into the wooded area near the prison before the guards came after them. The news of TJ's escape caused panic in the area, and especially with his victim's families who were afraid that he would come after them. Luckily, he and the other inmates were recaptured within 24 hours and transferred to Ohio State Penitentiary, which is a supermax prison in Youngstown, Ohio. While there, TJ was restricted to his cell for 23 hours a day with just one hour of recreation. What else did you do? That's it. Uh, I was okay. in a dumpster. That's it. Okay. What else? That's it. This teen is a heartless killer who went on a shooting rampage that ended up killing two people. Police say that he was just driving around and randomly picking targets to shoot at. And his reason for doing that was because he thought it would be cool. How twisted is that? The son was actually with the father when, when the father purchased the firearm, uh, actually picked out the type of firearm that he wanted his dad to, to buy. Why would a father buy a gun for his underage son? Let's look into the case of Conrad Schaefer, the teen with double life sentences who killed for fun. On Wednesday, June 26, 2013, at around 6 a.m., 17-year-old David Guero was walking near Central Avenue in Kissimmee, Florida, heading to the bus station where he was going to catch a bus to work. It was still dark outside, so he didn't notice the danger that was lurking in the shadows until it was too late. A guy was walking down the sidewalk, and a car went by, and it sounded like a gunshot. The guy's laying here along the road. I don't know if they cut him or what. Witnesses said they saw a car pass by and heard a gunshot before the teen fell to the ground. David was immediately rushed to a nearby hospital, where he was unfortunately pronounced dead. The shooting shook the entire community as they tried to understand why someone would do that? Was this thing random or targeted? And who was behind it? Very nervous, concerned about my grandkids and my kids and my son that lives with me and yeah. You know, it is shocking. Investigators said that David Guero was not a gang member, nor was he involved in any illegal activity. He was just going about his day when he was shot at for no apparent reason. An investigation into the shooting was launched, and the police searched the area for clues and asking anyone with information to come forward. As they were combing through the area with metal detectors, they found a spent shell casing, which was linked to David's death. The shell was also linked to other mysterious things that had been happening around the Oskala County, leaving many homes and cars riddled with bullets. Then on July 6, 2013, a week after the deadly shooting, police responded to a home in Poinciana, where a 22-year-old university student by the name of Eric Rupnerin had been killed in his own home. Investigators said that Eric's mom found him lying in a pool of gore with a gun wound in the face and multiple knife wounds. Can you imagine just how traumatic that must have been for the mom? Eric's entire family was completely heartbroken and devastated, especially his grandma, who said that she had just spoken to him an hour before he was killed. 11.36, I spoke to my grandson over the phone, and I make sure he eats, and he told me, yes, ma, I'm okay. Surprisingly, police said that there was no sign of forced entry, meaning that Eric had probably let in the killer. Some items from his home, including a television, video game console, and a phone, were missing. Detectives were able to find a shell casing in the home, which later matched the one that had been used to kill David at the bus stop. Ballistic evidence showed that the bullets came from a 45 point caliber high point rifle that was bought just two weeks earlier by 53 year old Lothar Schaefer. Police were able to track down Lothar, but they were not prepared for what they were about to uncover. 
Lothar, who has a hearing disorder, told detectives that he bought the high caliber rifle for, get this, his 15 year old son, Conrad Schaefer. The son was actually with the father when, when the father purchased the firearm, uh, actually picked out the type of firearm that he wanted his dad to, to buy. Apparently, Conrad was diagnosed with leukemia at the age of eight, and according to his parents, he was bullied because of his appearance during treatment. At some point, Conrad was befriended by some older guys in the area and was willing to do anything just to fit in. He would wait for his dad to fall asleep and then steal his car to go joyriding with his friends. But what started out as normal teenage rebellion soon turned deadly when his dad decided to buy him a gun and a hundred rounds of ammunition. The dad even took him to a shooting range, thinking that it would help boost his confidence after the alleged bullying. But apparently it did much more than that. This was around the time that the shooting spree began. And while Lothar came to learn about it, he reportedly took away the gun from Conrad, but never reported the incident to the police. He hid the gun in his closet, where police said Conrad could still access it easily. The result of uh, uh, Mr. Schaefer not securing his firearm is that we've had two homicides and, and what could have been tragically many more. Because of this, Lothar would later be charged with culpable negligence and allowing unlawful possession of a firearm. He pleaded no contest to the charges and was given four months in jail and two years of probation. Purchasing a firearm, the right to purchase a firearm is one thing, but you also have the right to make sure it's secure and kept out of the hands of those that should not have enough. Meanwhile, Conrad was arrested alongside three of his friends, including 20-year-old David Damas and Juan Sebastian Muriel and 17-year-old Victoria Rios. During his interrogation, Conrad seemed a little more concerned about going to jail than the fact that two people were dead. To get him to open up, the detective had to assure him that he might not necessarily go to jail because he was a minor when the crimes happened. We're juvie. That's just the way it is. So to be real with you right now, it, it's 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 going to be up to a juvenile judge and it's going to be up to what they think it's going to take for you to stop behaving that way and that's not necessarily always so jail you, time you don't you don't know if i could be doing life or not you can't do life dude for a freaking felony like that are you kidding me after a lot of persuasion, Conrad admitted that he and his friends had been going around shooting randomly at houses and cars in the area. The group had been involved in a total of 14 shootings, including one involving a police car before they were arrested. Were you the one doing the shooting? Not always. Okay. How many, okay, out of the next ones, how many would you say you would have been shooting? At least six or seven. Okay. Six or seven different places? However, when asked about Eric and David's murder, Conrad denied knowing anything about it, saying that he was not with the group when that happened. What else did you get? I said it a house. Okay. And I said it. Okay. What else? I said at some point, Conrad even broke down in tears and began asking for his dad, saying that he wanted to go home. What's bothering you now, Conrad? I think you know where it is. I know I just told you. I'm not going to do time. Bye. I'm just waiting for my dad, man. Your dad's fine. Your dad's fine. I mean, I don't even feel like living if I ain't going to see him. You ain't going to see him. Your dad's not going anywhere. He's fine. The detectives continued to push him to talk about what happened to David and Eric, but Conrad refused to reveal anything more, insisting that he had told them everything he knew. The gun's been taken out of my possession. Conrad and hidden. Conrad, where, where, where? It wasn't. It wasn't hidden very well. It was not hidden very well. No, okay. I, I, I put up my whole life down. Conrad, I put up my whole entire. Conrad, Conrad, look at me. I'm not, I Conrad, told, no, 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 I'm not, I'm you, not. I just told you everything. Okay, Conrad, I'm you. not calling, listen to me, man. I'm not calling you a killer. I'm not calling you a murderer. Okay? But I'm like, I'm just going to be honest with you. Just like I told you, I will be honest with you. I'm not going to sit here and listen to you tell me that you have no clue who's the one that pulled that trigger with that kid. And I'm going to say that I believe you because I don't. After going back and forth with him for over 40 minutes, the detective decided to bring in Conrad's dad, hoping that it would get the teen to open up and tell the truth. Sorry, Tommy. Okay. Okay. 
At this point, Conrad broke down and apologized to his dad for what he did, but still refused to give a full confession, claiming that he was afraid of what the others might do to him if he testified against them. You're gonna have to have me testify or something. No, that's part of what? You will that's part of what? Conrad. I'm against the person that did this. Con Conrad. And I'm gonna get like, like killed or something. It took a lot of convincing from his dad for Conrad to finally open up. He told detectives that he had only been hanging out with the other two guys, David and Juan, for about two to three months before they started up houses. He said that he thought the guys were his friends, but apparently they were using him. Conrad said that he met Victoria about two weeks ago when she started living with David after running away from her own home. Uh, she's supposed to be on an Amber Alert or something. On the matter of who sh David Guero and Eric, Conrad blamed everything on his co-accused, David Domus. He claimed that David was driving his dad's car when they spotted Guero that morning at the bus stop and David decided to kill him. On that night, Eric was killed. Conrad claimed that David had borrowed his dad's car and gun and left with Victoria, saying that they were going to get rent money. He claimed that he didn't know what happened until the two came back and told him that they had killed someone. Now, while Conrad might have tried to make himself appear less involved in the murders, detectives would learn something completely different. Apparently, on the morning that David Guerra was killed, the four suspects were driving around town in Conrad's dad's car when they spotted him at the bus stop. Then, Conrad reportedly thought that it would be fun to shoot a person, so he took out the rifle and pulled the trigger. Correct, Conrad is our shooter and David was driving the vehicle. After their first taste of killing, the group waited until the night of July 3rd to rob, attack, and kill Eric. Victoria was apparently the one that came up with the idea of robbing Eric because he had been bragging about some money that he had gotten from his insurance. She already knew Eric as he had offered her a place to stay before. So she contacted him and tricked him into believing that she was going to sleep with him for money. But when she showed up at his doorstep, she wasn't alone. When Eric opened the door for Victoria, police said that she went in and let the others, who then forced Eric to give them all the money he had. They were furious to learn that he only had $300 on him. So according to Victoria, the guys pushed her outside and forced Eric to sit on the floor. Victoria said that she watched through the window as David did a countdown and shot Eric in the face. At this point, Victoria said that she went in and pointed out that Eric was still breathing. And that's when Conrad pounced on him with a kitchen knife and savagely jabbed Eric in the neck several times. Eric's last words were, please don't kill me. After mercilessly killing him, the group then ransacked his house and made away with several household items. Let them suffer and die and rot in jail. Live imprisonment, a hundred year each one of them. All four suspects were charged with two counts of first degree murder, home invasion with a firearm, and grand theft. Since Juan was not mentioned directly as an active participant in any of the murders, he was offered a plea deal of 10 years jail sentence if he agreed to testify against the others. This large kitchen knife was found resting on top of Eric Rupnarine's chest on July 4th. The 22-year-old Point Sienna man was also found with a gunshot wound to the face when Osceola County Sheriff's deputies arrived to his home on Mendoza Lane. According to evidence enclosed in this 300-page document, the state says these four young suspects, now charged with first-degree murder, devised a way to get rent money from Rup Noreen, who had apparently bragged about having $18,000 from a car accident. David was the first to go to trial in June 2015. During the trial, he denied Eric, claiming that he left the house when he saw Conrad with the gun. I think what happened to Eric is, is messed up, man, and he, he deserved justice, but I'm not the one that did it to him. At some point, he was even involved in a heated exchange with the prosecutor, telling him that he would look bad if it turned out that he was innocent. So you think that my public persona is affected by whether we convict you personally? Yeah, it's because um, when you lost the Casey Anthony case, that made you look bad. David was eventually found guilty of killing Eric and was sentenced to life in prison. As for Victoria, because of the role she played in Eric's brutal murder, she was also found guilty of first degree murder and sentenced to 30 years in prison. Conrad's trial was set to begin in January 2016, but before it started, he took a plea deal and pleaded guilty to two counts of first degree murder. During his sentencing hearing, he gave a half-hearted apology to his victims' families. I was 15 at the time, and I'm really sorry for the things I've done. 
And I know I did wrong, and I know my apologies don't mean nothing to you. And I know they ain't gonna change how you feel about me. Understandably, the families didn't accept the apology, which they felt was not sincere. I request my grandson, he was my helper to me and my wife. At this time, my family and I had no intention to forgive the guilty because of such a heinous and brutal crime that was done to my grandson. Eric's mom also called him a monster who deserved to be locked up for life. A monster and deserved to rot in jail for lifetimes for what you did to my son, who was harmless, decent young man that was raised with lots of love and respect. I don't know about your upbringing, nor do I care, because you violated our home and trespassed uninvited when you should have been in your home, not ours. In the end, Conrad was given two life sentences for the murders of both David and Eric. But because of his age at the time of the crimes, he'll be eligible for parole after 25 years. Speaking right now on News 6 at noon, a teenager accused of going on a weeks long spree in Osceola County just learned his fate in court. Good afternoon, I'm Justin Mormuth. Two people were killed in those 2013 shootings when the suspect was only 15 years old. Investigators say Conrad Schaefer took part in nearly two dozen shootings. Now he'll be spending the rest of his life behind bars. What do you think about this case? Do you believe Conrad's dad deserved to get jail time for buying the gun? Let me know in the comment section and be sure to like and subscribe for more.